What sort of wretched abomination do I bring to you today, you may be asking? Well, you saw the thumbnail, and uh, what even is this thing? Well, I was hoping it was a fever dream, but after confirming the request from a person on my Patreon, I literally had to message them afterwards asking, what the hell even is this? But by God, we're gonna get through this somehow, so just uh, put a helmet on. Also, my wife has COVID. I'm still testing negative, but uh, yeah, it's not looking good. So if I sound weird, that's probably why. In the 1980s, and what I can only assume is the most heavy-handed anti-drug movie ever, like there was absolutely no subtlety down to to, like the brother hooking up with your girlfriend because you're too interested in that sweet sweet listerine colored brain juice all given to you by some sort of parasitic thing like <laughs> I don't even know what this thing is. Someone made this, by the way. Like, somebody looked at the design of this thing and was like, yep, that's it. That's the terrifying thing we're going with. Anyways, this thing would somehow get out of a couple's apartment bathtub in an apartment complex, and after failing to locate the creature, our boy here would end up becoming its personal meat mech. This thing would basically control him with a promise of making him feel really, really good for a while at least, and then while he was feeling really good, it would be absolutely wrecking people. Now, look, of course we can go into how certain substances destroy the world, and and how this is just an allegory for drug use, but that's not fun. So we're gonna approach this thing for what it is. A turd-shaped monster that injects feel-good juice into you and onto your brain. So in today's episode, we're gonna be talking about this thing and the neurological control it exhibits over the human body. What well, first, this episode is sponsored by Upside. Upside is a cashback app that enables you to get more value from your purchases and improves profitability of local businesses. They partner with 30,000 businesses and 25,000 gas stations across 48 states. So how does it work? Well, you open up the app and claim whatever offer you like, whether that be food, gas, or groceries. Then you go ahead and head there and check in at the business through the app and choose which card you'll be using, or upload a receipt pick later and then pay as usual. From here, Upside will send you the difference. For example, gas is expensive. Well, you can get up to 15 cents cheaper using the app, and I actually found it 20 cents cheaper on a recent trip. I went there, bought the gas, and Upside sent me the difference based on the 20 cents. Which, considering it was a forerunner and I was driving hundreds of miles, that ends up adding up. How this whole process works is pretty on people showing up to these individual businesses in order to purchase something. So you really don't have to pay in or use any special points that are only usable at Upside and there's no limit on how you can actually earn. Then the businesses get your business and everybody wins. So this is actual money going back to you and you can withdraw it at any point and then put it back into your account. And even then, if you don't want that, you can cash it out on gift cards too. And if you share Upside with friends today, you can increase your own earnings. So if all that sounds good to you, then heading the link in my description, you too can start earning money back today because gas has just gone completely insane. So we start off our story with the most 80s intro in existence. Then we go on to see a bunch of relics all over the walls, which will have nothing to do with anything, along with a bunch of textbooks about human anatomy, which is uh, actually pretty fun to read sometimes. As an old man comes in, he locks like 12 locks on his door. His wife comes running up to him asking, how big are they? Which is what you always want your wife asking, but it's a bunch of monkey brains. As she goes on to serve whatever it is in the tub, Din Din, she breaks out in this long, massively drawn out scream because she's officially been like totally cut off man talk about harshing her mellow the husband comes in and then starts losing it as well as his mellow was ruined too meanwhile in an adjacent apartment a man gets a call from what i can assume is like 8 p.m a woman is calling him saying he should be getting ready as the elderly couple then tears apart their entire home like complete crackheads like why break the plates too no idea i'm just assuming they're probably completely fiending at this point anyhow as tough guy in the tank top goes to answer the door also known as mike barbara goes in to Brian and sees that he appears to be sick. Meanwhile, elderly couple arrives at their neighbor's door to check on her bathtub. Like, they just sort of walk in. See? Crackhead behavior. So Barbara was electing to stay with Brian that night rather than going to the concert, but uh, Brian just sort of like pawns her off on Mike, who's clearly interested in her. Also, they're like standing super close. Look, all I'm saying is it's a great way to lose your girlfriend. So Brian goes back to sleep as Mike remarks Brian will be a new man in the morning. Meanwhile, the elderly couple are just straight up withdrawing and foaming at the mouth. As Brian sleeps, he's moving around a lot and has a pretty good headache, but he's also bleeding. He then checks his bed to find that his neck is actually bleeding pretty severely, which I would have to say if I woke up covered in blood like that, uh, I might be a little relieved to find it's my neck rather than uh, other parts of my body. He falls into the bathtub in some of the greatest acting I've ever seen this side of the Mississippi, and our boy Brian is just straight up tripping. And again I ask, Aspie, why did you watch this and subsequently make me watch this? As he lays there, the room begins changing in the most uninteresting ways, such as light turning into a 
painted eye. And the room now fills with Listerine, which, uh, I mean, that would probably just be more disturbing than anything. That said, Brian doesn't know what's up, but my concern would be I'm having a massive stroke. We then see some 80s effect water. It amazing. And Brian is literally almost drowned by Listerine. Waking up, he checks the hole in his neck and realizes it's definitely a hole. A needle hole. <laughs> and the bathtub is full of water. Brian says he knows someone is there, and we get this god-awful thing. Like, wait for this reveal. Also, the noise that it makes going around his abdomen, it's like somebody literally put a microphone up to a person's abdomen and just listen to the noise it makes. So then this thing appears on Brian's shoulder. Bro, someone thought this thing up. And I, they literally had to sit there and say, this will work as an antagonist. I love it. The thing then tells him the start of his new life has begun with no pain, no sadness, and he's the only thing he will need. He just needs to listen to the light. Now, Brian doesn't know it yet, but this thing's name is apparently Elmer, which I'll explain that later. But then he tells Brian to go for a walk as he's hungry. He will do all the thinking from here, so just put him on his neck. I don't know. I'm just as confused as you are with these interactions. So Brian grabs his turd-shaped thing and puts it on his neck. And oh god, I just hate how, like, look at him walk with it. It just swings its tail around. <laughs> so it opens its mouth, revealing teeth, and a needle comes out that stabs him in the brainstem. Meanwhile, in his brain, it stabs through it and then drops some liquid onto the brain, creating an electric shock. Brian is officially straight tripping again. Oh, Brian, didn't your parents ever tell you to stay away from turd monsters that get you high? So Mike and Barbara return to find Brian missing. Mike takes her home as Brian is running all over the city. He ends up being a junkie in a junkyard, seeing all the colors and whatnot. And like I gotta tell you, it doesn't even look that cool. But while he's screaming about the backlights on the cars, he alerts the junkyard guard, who immediately pulls out his force multiplier. Like, like man, don't you think that's a little much? I don't know. So as Brian runs amongst the cars, definitely not getting tetanus along the way, he's being stalked by the guard who takes his job way too seriously. Then Brian spots it. A broken windshield. Amazing. The guard goes to frisk Brian for some reason. I'm not really sure that's his job, but he tells him to roll over because he felt something. Now, something shaped like that, I'm not sure I'd be asking anybody to roll over. As he feels it, Elmer begins its attack, going straight for the brain. Brian watches on as he's really too buzzed to do anything about Elmer until he finally breaks through the skull and into that delicious frontal lobe. God, I hate watching this thing eat. Actually, you know what? I just hate this thing. So Brian says, juice me, bro, as Elmer gives him some more watercolors, causing him to feel it, Mr. Krabs, as he descends back down into his jacket. Meanwhile, back at home, Mike waits for Barbara as he tells her he's been sleeping for like 17 hours and hasn't come out of his room in days. Either that, if he's not in his room, he's in his bathtub. He also added a ton of locks to a bunch of doors, and also there's just a ton of buckets of water like everywhere. Basically, he's acting very sus. Again, it's an old meme, but it checks out. Then we get this very uncomfortable, uh, okay, the thing just appears in the water between his legs and he freaks out like, all right, uh, you know what? I think I've already conveyed this movie is just one giant acid trip enough. You get it. Later on, he does make it to his date and Barbara starts talking to Brian about what it feels to be massively high. As he tries to explain to Barbara further, Elmer ends up jabbing him to make him stop. And as he does, he spots brains in his spaghetti and meatballs as they all become just like breathing brains. Ooh, spooky. Brian then gets up and nopes out of there as Barbara is talking about being together, uh, which is great for your relationship's lifespan, but it doesn't matter because Brian needs to feel the colors once more. Walking through the city, he heads into an alleyway with some dude drinking back there. As Brian talks to a wall for a moment, he lets Elmer out, who juices him up once again. So now we're heading to a nightclub known as Hell. Man, it is violently 80s in there. Which, uh, did you know 1980 was 42 years ago? Ah, God, it's terrible. So we see one woman watching Brian because he's wearing a suit and obviously is out of place. She realizes he's just totally screwed in the head and goes in to dance with him. So obviously, this means they end up outside. Then we get this scene. <laughs> Alright, so I can't show this because Susan will be on me like ugly on an ape, but as Brian starts passing out, she uh, feels Elmer in his pants and is like, oh cool, you got a real monster in there. And then she just kind of goes for it. So this has to be blurred for sure. Well, as she goes for it, it goes through her mouth and into her brain to start snacking on that sweet, sweet brainstem. <laughs> Trust me, this won't be the last ridiculous thing that happens like this. So Brian heads back inside past another dude who's not looking so hot. And as Mike then hangs out in his whitey tidies in a shot that nobody needed to see, Barbara calls him. Meanwhile, Brian goes and changes out of his pants and I didn't need to see that either. Editor, alas, we're gonna have to blur that as well. While he's changing, he checks his underwear and finds blood. <laughs> Meanwhile, the elderly man yells at him, saying that he's been feeding them human brains and he's only making him stronger. Then we get the most relatable part of this movie. The elderly man told him, you've been feeding Aylmer. <laughs> He's like, you named him Elmer? Which I felt that. But oh wait, again, it's Aylmer. A-Y-L-M-E-R, which apparently means all-inspiring famous one, apparently. 
He then talks about its history of how the turd came to be and how it gets you high and it was taken from person to person. Basically, this thing is just super old, so its lifespan is quite expansive. Brian makes a break for it as the old man yells about how it's his. As Brian runs inside, Mike asks him what's up as he goes then and packs his stuff. Mike attempts to help him out, but Brian just nopes out of there and goes to the worst part of town. Walking through the city once more, he ends up at the Sunshine Motel. A nice place if your mind is completely melted. It's kind of like that clown motel out in the uh, southwest. Not gonna be staying there. He drops Elmer in the sink and starts asking him if what the old man said was true. And Elmer says, yeah, Scott, Aylmer says yes, and that they kept him there, feeding him animal brains and draining him, and that he will leave Brian too if he goes back to feeding him animals. Brian at this point sort of pieces it together that he can't think straight. Then we get the best line in the movie. Brian can't remember the night before, right? And I quote, all I remember is finding something sticky in my pants and then finding some blood. A true masterpiece of dialogue. Elmer says, the blood came from a girl whose brains he sucked out, and then he proceeds to say, that he sucked the guard dry too. All right. So this is obviously disturbing to Brian as he's running around town basically sucking people dry when he's elevated. The other shoe now drops and Elmer says that they will keep taking people out since he's hungry. Now Brian is in full withdrawal while Elmer lulls at him from the sink. Brian holds out for a while, all the while Elmer is talking smack about going out. During this withdrawal, you have your standards, hallucinations, sweating, life in general just sort of sucking. Later, Brian is awoken by Elmer singing and is finally broken. Like, bro, you're already withdrawing. Just Keep it going, obviously. But he folds and decides that he needs to feed Elmer first. Heading outside of his room, he tries to break into a few doors, all fails as this random dude talking about nuclear war then goes into his room. Like, there was no need for him to show, I don't know. Anyways, Brian then heads to, uh, like, the public shower in the hotel where this all has to be blurred out. And there's, like, this super buff dude in there who's just chilling and tells him it's cool. Nobody's gonna bother him. Which, uh, I actually like this dude, so I'm glad he doesn't get taken out. So then the turd slides out of his towel and towards Swolgols over here, but is not able to get to him in time, so years of working out not wasted. Instead, it elects to go after a dude in the bathroom. It attacks him and then eats his brain as someone literally probably uses a Hershey bottle, like Hershey's syrup bottle with red food coloring to spray it all over the stall. Now Brian is feeling a lot better, having gotten his high and ceasing his withdrawal. He heads back home as Mike starts moving in on Barbara. Mike picks up Barbara on the rebound, telling her she's special. That's usually how it goes. Mike asks Barbara if he should take her home, but nope. They end up hooking up instead while Brian listens in the other room like a total weirdo. So this whole scene, like one of those is, it's just, I can't show it. But you gotta ask yourself, do you think it was awkward to film this on camera? I think it was probably pretty awkward. Brian continues to lay there listening to which, oh my god, Elmer emerges in the blanket like the force perspective. Anyway, so Elmer whispers to Brian to get him juiced once more as we pan over to the ceiling which is now just stars. So then we get this horrible scene where it's Mike, Brian, and Barbara and he's got like suction cups all over him as then he eats Barbara's brain. Later, he exits the room and well, it's not really a confrontation, but he just tells Mike and Barbara to go as Mike protests saying that he can't just leave and expect nothing to happen. I don't know, man. I mean, if I'm down on my luck and my brother tried to hook up with my wife, I think I'd still be a little mad. But anyways, no idea why Barbara says it's not what it looks like, because I think it so most certainly is what it looks like. But Brian goes on to say that he's hungry again and he wants them to go for their own safety. So Brian nopes out of there as Barbara chases him down. He stops her yelling that one brain is good as the next, but she continues to chase him down into the subway. He hides behind a pillar like a complete just I don't know what he's doing as a train approaches. I have no idea why he leans his head back, but he likes to get on the train and get out of there, probably to go to La Crosse, Wisconsin or something. Barbara tries to talk to him as every time she looks away, Elmer comes out of his mouth. Like, this is completely new. He's never done this before. He was never internal to Brian. Why is he internal to Brian right now? So anyways, then we get this part where this man sits across from him, and I can only assume this is a call out to the movie Basket Case. This is the thing about references based on things happening on a specific time. They don't really age well. Barbara says that Brian needs help as Brian looks at the basket case man who then just walks away because even he's creeped out. Whoa! Barbara then makes out with Brian as she then has her brain eaten at which point this goes to show you can't really try to help people if they don't want to be helped. Then you just end up getting bodied in the process. Remember those wise words from Roanoke. Brian then leaves Barbara on the train bench in the most city life thing imaginable as nobody checks on the girl bleeding from her mouth not moving. Brian is now a big sad as he goes and looks for the old man behind the trash can. He pulls off his turtleneck 
thick sweater as it has blood all over it. The elderly couple have now arrived with a force multiplier. Some random dude shows up, then gets lead thrown at him, which he's never shown again, which, I mean, does make sense. The old woman grabs Aylmer and goes straight for her brain as her husband stands by idly before finally making a move on the thing. The force multiplier gets thrown around at this point as the old man tries to hold off a one pound organism, but it's able to get into his skull and eats his brain as well. Brian finally sees this thing for what it's doing and is big spooked over it. Aylmer tells Brian basically to put him on his neck as the old man wakes up. As Aylmer goes to stab Brian in the neck, he squeezes the absolute hell out of Aylmer, juicing Brian's brain to the maximum capacity, which is pretty hilarious. He takes out Aylmer because he got squeezed too hard and the old man collapses because his brain was bleeding. I can't believe nobody thought of this before. And as Brian is now basically having a seizure, he starts forming this giant boil in his forehead. As Mike goes to call Barbara, Brian then comes home, leaking blue everywhere. As he goes to take himself out, instead, <laughs> just, what the sweet hell is this? Brian's brain just becomes pure light, and he now officially has brain damage. You watched it, you can't unwatch it. So where to begin with Aylmer? What makes a lady of A go out on the loose? Why does a gander meander in search of a goose? Well, believe it or not, what he's doing to the human brain is actually quite interesting based on his diet and influence on human neurology. But before getting there, first we must talk about what in the name of all that is holy even is an Aylmer. That's right, I'm actually taking this serious in the science portion because, I mean, that's why we're here anyhow. Probably, I don't know. Maybe it's just for the B-movie reviews. I'm not a cop. You can stay here and listen to the science portion if you want, but let's get to it. First and foremost, Aylmer is most definitely a parasite of some sort. However, with that said, he's not a traditional parasite. Typically, the under understanding that we have, or at least a designation of a parasite, is using another species or host as food. But there is a middle step in terms of Aylmer's species. It doesn't just use another species for food, which would make it a predator more than anything, but actually it will use a member of the same species to hunt more of its own kind, giving it the ability to get close to what it needs, which is ultimately going to result at the end of that prey. That's the main issue with the true label of the parasite, because it does not really consume the host in the process, but still needs the host in order to hunt others. With that said, I I suppose we could call this thing a parasite anyhow, because without another host, its hunting ability becomes severely limited. However, even by that metric, it still does not necessarily need a host, seeing as he ends up leaving Brian in the shower while it went off to completely hunt on its own. Even still though, by enticing a more mobile animal to help it, its ability to move around and search out the area for new meals makes it much more of a threat. So anyhow, moving on. As Aylmer is, at least quasi-parasitic, but is definitely also a predator, Aylmer in no way appears to hail from this planet, but does have compassion compatible biology to a degree in order to manipulate homo sapiens on this planet. But it could be assumed that due to its understanding of neurology when it comes to humans on a planet of say just animals, their brain tissue would operate a lot like ours, which I will go into later on how Aylmer actually has compatible chemicals to our brains in the first place, because this would give him the ability to actually get any animal hooked on what he has regardless of species or planet. Aylmer touched down on Earth presumably thousands of years ago based on the old man's explanation, which shows their species is extremely long lived. Apart from physical violence considering the body is extremely weak, but due to the lifespan that they have, this would mean their genome is incredibly stable and not prone to as many errors and issues like earthlings would be. After passing through civilization to civilization hijacking humans along the way in order to get them to do his bidding, he would ultimately fall into the hands of Brian, where his potentially immortal life would be cut short at the hands of the old man who would squeeze him to his end, resulting in all his fluids being evacuated from his body and internal issues leading to the rupturing of major organs leading to an internal bleed out. But then again, we all saw that. So let's move on to this thing's physical morphology so then we can get to the actual good stuff. Starting with the turd, this thing is basically a turd. I swear to God, you've seen it, I've seen it. We both get it. Its body ends in a conical shape, giving it almost like a stocky snake appearance. Given the coloring on its skin being darker, this would seem to suggest it may hail from a planet with intense solar radiation, giving what we know about pigmentation protecting its genetic coating. This may also hint at why its coating is so stable as the darker coloring would protect it from things like UV radiation. However, what I do find odd based on its pigmentation is its eyes, although it may not be as strange as you might imagine, or at least I imagine it to be. If we would look at the coloring of its body, it's clear its species, while having a darker complexion, also seems to favor some blue pigmentation. In nature, the color blue is extremely rare, as there's not much use in terms of purpose for combining yellow and green pigmentation in order to create it. But it does exist, and it has existed in humans before. Known as the Blue Fugates of Kentucky, this family was obviously the hills of Kentucky, 
the end would have a blood disorder brought on by a genetic trait that resulted in a disorder known as mehemoglobinemia, and that's definitely a mouthful, that would result in their skin becoming blue-tinged, but not due to pigmentation. Instead, it was brought on by too little oxygen being delivered to the integument system, and as a result, the skin would turn blue in this disorder. But see, that's the weird part. This was a complete disorder of the genome. With Aylmer, on the other hand, the coloring seems to be pigmentation, and as a result, this would have to conclude that the species, while it being rare on our planet, might be the standard from where it's from. This pigmentation also extends to the eyes of this creature, resulting in blue eyes that we see. Which, if you didn't know, the amount of melanin is what gives you eye color. Higher melanin is going to give you brown eyes, and lower is going to give you blues and greens. In Elmer's case, it's just blue pigmentation across the board that gives him blue eyes. Under those blue eyes sits an abomination of random teeth with varying size. You have the more forward-facing teeth, used to go on the offensive to crack into skulls, and the smaller needle-like teeth, which are used for biting and tearing away. The mouth can open up to almost half the length of the body in order to allow for the creature to latch onto the skull in order to break into it as well. Concerning the internal organs, we would have to assume this creature would have a lot of similar structures like the creatures on our planet, at least to a degree. The first being a stomach in order to break down the incoming nutrition. However, from here, something different appears to be going on, and if I'm right in what I think happens later, which, who knows, maybe I am, we're gonna get to that here in a second. Elmer would need to also possess an oxygen metabolism, much like any species on this planet. The reason nitrogen is a noble gas, and I'm just kidding about that, it is not a noble gas. So yeah, real quickly, uh, I massively messed up in my other, I think it was District 9 video, uh, <laughs> nitrogen's not a noble gas, but the point was, back to what I was saying in that, was it's actually inert like a noble gas. Yeah, I messed that up. Anyhow, the reason is because Earth's atmosphere, which is 78% nitrogen, is triple bonded with another nitrogen. So while nitrogen by its lonesome is reactive, nitrogen triple bonded in our atmosphere with another nitrogen is incredibly stable at normal temperatures and pressures, basically down here on this planet. This does not a good metabolic source of energy make. However, O2 is still reactive despite being bonded with another oxygen. As a result, it can be paired with things like carbon and put through a metabolic cycle in order to create energy for the body to use. Because of this, I would have to suspect that Aylmer is a carbon-based organism relying on an oxygen metabolism in order to power its body, and considering it needs to eat other carbon organisms for sustenance, this supports that thinking as well. That coupled with the fact that he gets hugged by a hand to death and bleeds red, which suggests iron-based blood, which carries oxygen. But moving away from the metabolism, intellectually this species of animal does appear highly intelligent, either as smart as humans or possibly even smarter, but may have actually possessed a more technologically advanced status or at least hijacked a more technologically advanced species member in order to get to Earth. The reason I suspect this to be the case that they didn't just ride an asteroid here or were adrift through space is because their bodies are incredibly fragile and would not be able to handle that. Instead, long ago, considering they were able to get humans to do what they want to do, I believe at some point another species may have found this creature and considering it can talk and reason, it may have been able to convince a member of another species to work with it towards the ultimate goal, acquiring brains. Given its savagery at first when dealing with any species in order to eat, this would make sense, and I believe it all comes to its ability to interact with any species at any point, given what it eats and what it injects. So we know with Aylmer, the needle-like appendage that comes out of its mouth appears to be concentrated something. When it works its way through the back of the neck and into the brainstem, continuing up to the actual brain itself and exiting through the cerebral cortex, this liquid is able to drip onto the brain and diffuse within it. Once this happens, electrical activity in the brain is increased by quite a bit, which results in an elevated feeling of reality and mood in general. The question becomes, how does this work exactly, and what is that liquid dripping out? Well, it's no secret, it gets you high as all get out, boy, but how is that accomplished? I believe Elmer, in this aspect, is a great parasite. Given how much he has really spent with humanity and how much time he's spent, it's likely it didn't take him long to figure out the chemicals in our brains and how it affects us, which arguably was rather easy for this creature given its own biology. So here's what I believe is happening with this species, at least with Elmer in particular. We see that it does eat brains. Whatever species' brains that it actually eats, I believe it has a process in its intestines or stomach that will not chemically destroy the neurochemicals from the brains that it eats. Instead, these chemicals are taken to a holding area where they can be used to manipulate another species. This means that after its first takedown, it would be able to keep these chemicals to get more of the chemicals to continue on its hunt, which also makes the first interaction potentially the most dangerous so that it can get a foothold. But after the takedown, Endler gets the actual nutrition from the brain where the neurochemicals are kept. And this may be why eating animal brains was making it weaker because the chemicals that it was keeping were not as potent, which means when it injected Brian, it did not have as much of an effect as other chemicals gotten from humans. This process would allow the creature to interact with any species in any way. Rather than having to make just broad 
chemical stuff, which would result in its ability to manipulate any species it runs across. It can use the species naturally occurring chemicals in order to accomplish this. This completely eliminates the issue of different receptors in any different life forms. Because in our brain, you know the big ones, right? Dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, etc. How would the species be able to interact with our brain in the same way of manipulation as say an alien who has none of these chemical signatures or receptors? It wouldn't. So by using the brain as the source for these neurotransmitters, it is able to 100% of the time match it amongst species in order to properly hunt. So how exactly does this affect the brain? Well, after looking into drug interactions within the brain, I think I have it narrowed down based on context clues and subsequent withdrawal symptoms. The first thing I would like to point out is Brian's affinity for Elm. It seemed like their relationship pretty much came out of nowhere and not just because he was getting buzzed the whole time whenever he wanted. But there is a specific chemical in the brain known to inspire feelings of trust and bonding in a short amount of time. Now, typically with something like bonding with animals, people, your children, whatever, one of the chemicals released is oxytocin. This is known as the love drug or love chemical anyways, but there are other neurotransmitters that can be utilized in this process. Serotonin is known that when it's released in high quantities can almost immediately make you strike up a bond with somebody and inherently trust them. Taking a look at the symptoms of withdrawal for a moment, when Brian decides that he's going to be in control, he's already basically screwed himself. We see him shivering and sweating on the ground as well as experiencing muscle spasm. These are all symptoms of withdrawal associated with a lot of drugs, but one in particular that appears to fit the bill based on basically the trust that's formed out of nowhere would be something likened to MDMA or party drugs. These specific drugs work by inhibiting reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine within the synaptic gap. Typically the process is as the body releases these neurotransmitters, they will find their mark in the neuron on the other side of the gap, leading to feelings of mild euphoria, trust, bonding, and in general communication. Then the chemicals are taken back up in a process known as reuptake and chemically destroyed or recycled so that they don't just continue to build up in the gap. This process is great until you start chemically altering it with MDMA. When you take this, it will cause the synaptic gap to continue to fill up with these neurotransmitters by binding to the reuptake areas and stopping them from properly operating. On top of this, this will stimulate the release of more serotonin and enter the neurons themselves, getting the neuron ready to release more. All of this leads to way more than what is considered normal to accumulate in the synaptic gap, leading to a massive feeling of euphoria, seeing colors, and an explosion of activity in the brain. However, it's not all great, because if it was, then there wouldn't be problems. The issue with this process is the after effects. As your brain struggles to reach its baseline once more due to the massive release of serotonin as the body destroys more than what's natural, this will leave you with a deficit of serotonin when your brain returns to its normal operability. This can lead you to basically experiencing depression, sweating, dietary changes, and in general, a less reactive brain. As a result, you feel like you're coming down hard, which leads some people to actually seek out more to stop the symptoms. Now, this is the effect of the neurochemicals on the brain, but I do not believe Elmer is releasing MDMA because if we take a look at Brian after the first few times with Elmer controlling him, he seems pretty much okay. So I believe half the process is taking place. Rather than Elmer stimulating Brian's brain to the point of releasing these chemicals naturally, leading to the brain depleting itself, I believe Elmer is providing the chemicals necessary to give him the high equivalent to an MDMA ingestion. But his own natural cells are not losing neurochemicals themselves. This is why Brian is capable of moving on once the high is done, at least at the beginning. During these times, things like memory formation is also severely inhibited, which is why he seems to remember very little once he comes down. Now, I can already hear you, but Roanoke, if the creature is providing the chemicals, then his brain wouldn't be depleted. So then how is he going through such terrible withdrawal later on? And you are correct. Look at you. You're a smart fella instead of a fart smeller. The key to this is that you have to see what happens to the brain once a massive amount of serotonin amongst other neurochemicals are released into the brain on the other side of it, apart from just depletion of said neurochemicals. A test was conducted on primates who were given MDMA twice daily for four days. That's it, just four days, eight doses total. They found that after this test, there was an apparent amount of brain damage to the primates. Ha, <laughs> he said it. Basically, they had a reduced number of serotonergic neurons at two weeks, but then up to seven years later, they still had a reduced amount from their baseline that was quite noticeable, but it had recovered at least some. Basically, the brain, even after seven years later, after only eight doses, had issues with serotonin activation. What was most interesting with the study was that specifically in rodents, one to two weeks after binge dosing with MDNA, which is three to four doses in a day, rats showed a decreased expression of serotonin transporter, which allows for cells to reuptake and recycle serotonin. So basically, because of the massive buildup of serotonin in the brain, the brain would do what the brain does and says, oh, hey, I've noticed we have like four chemo receptors for this chemical, but there appears to be like 16 units of this chemical. So why don't we just 
make 16 chemoreceptors since there's so much floating around the synaptic gap, which in turn, when going back to your baseline, means that you really only had like four units naturally, and you can never really hope to fill all 16 receptors. Over time, your brain will repair to a certain degree to sort of readjust, but it does appear to take quite a while. Then on top of this, the recycling process your brain uses to naturally preserve these chemicals and send them back through just in a more broken down state would be damaged, causing them to no longer properly function, leading to a breakdown in communication. This means that at first, Brian's brain would have too many issues dealing with the serotonin released in his brain. But after basically weeks of hanging out with Elmer, his brain would be permanently altered to his detriment, meaning that he was reliant on Elmer to give him the chemicals he needed just to even have his brain operate properly, which this is exactly what Elmer uses to subdue any individual. It appears he doesn't really trend towards animal brains and needs a certain level of sapience for it to effectively work. This is because he can reason with sapience to go out and get what he needs so he can give them what they need. With an animal, there is a breakdown because the level of understanding wouldn't be there and instead the animal wouldn't react in a way that Elmer would be able to manipulate. So to wrap this up, Aspie, why did you watch this? But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. No, really, because let even. And if you enjoyed, leaving a like would be great, and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and streaming channel links in the description for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronauts, Charles and Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you, guys. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientists, Countryside Limbo, Demon Ripper, and Phoenix. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I will see y'all.